Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. Some of you walk with Jesus. Some of you have Jesus living in your heart. Some of you talk about Jesus. Some of you debate about Jesus. But many of you, even some of you born again Christians, don't really know who Jesus is. And I'm going to tell you. All right, here we go. Now, this is going to be a lot of reading. I'm doing something very different. I've never done before dealing with this. So I want you to go along with me and don't get bored because this is deep. This is dealing with spiritual warfare, your walk with the Lord, knowing in whom you believe and understanding how that works out in your life. So let me make sure I am recording. Yes, I am. And we are going to. Ha. Huh. Let's start with Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to follow my heart on this one. I believe that's the first thing we should go to. Revelation chapter 1. And we will be back in Revelation in a minute. All right. Revelation chapter 1 tells us a few things, and I want you to know what it is. The, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, verse 2, who bear record of the word and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of the things that he saw. This is a promise for those of you who have never read the book of Revelation, you think you're going to go cuckoo if you read it. But this is the promise from God. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Now, let's scoot on over to Isaiah 53. That's laying the foundation for who Jesus really is. Because you're going to know as you follow on with me to know. All right. Isaiah 53. Mm -mm -mm. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. For he had no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Mm. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Many folks to this day refuse to esteem him as the one he is, deity. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But listen to this, and I'm going to stop here, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Now listen, I want to paint a quick picture real quick before I go any further. How many of you can picture yourselves getting ready to be arrested, getting ready to do time in the big house? for 10, 20, 30, 50 years without the possibility of parole. And somebody steps up and says, wait, I know I didn't commit the crime, but let me do the time. I know I didn't commit the crime, but let me lay on that bed for that death sentence and let, and let them stick my arms with it. Now, the person who is being sentenced would be shocked that anybody would even offer to do anything like that. But here's the biggest shock to all of you who don't really get what was done on the cross. Jesus stepped in and paid all of our penalties. You get me? Now, we see him as a baby in the manger, don't we? We see the cute little Christmas cards and all of that. And before I go any further, we got to do one thing. Father, we ask you right now for your heavy anointing 
Lord, forgive us all for sin. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word. Open up me, Lord. Hide me behind the cross. Help me bring an anointed message to show people who you really are. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Now, we were talking so much, we forgot to pray. I realized that. So listen, you guys, listen to this. I want you to picture that person stepping in your place. Well, that's what Jesus did. He did that on the cross. Here's the sad part. Most people won't receive the gift of redemption he gave all of us. But we, if we don't receive it, it's not ours to have. If you receive it, it is. But you must believe it to receive it. All right. Now, you may not believe it all. Your faith might be as small as a, as a mustard seed. But then there are some of you who are walking with him and you still don't realize who you're walking with. You ever see these movies where the king of the nation gets all dolled up in street clothes and they have their little, their, their closest people dress them up in, in, in regular everyday Joe outfits so nobody knows that it's the king walking down the street. Why are they doing it? They want to know what the people are going through. So they go as a, as a common Joe. And they don't let anybody know they're the king. And they hear what people say about the leadership. They see what the struggles are that people are going through. And it softens their heart with compassion. And they want to do more about it because now they have a clearer view of what their people are going through. But the sad part is the people are right there in the face of their king. And they don't see it. They don't recognize it. Now that's the way it is with Jesus. We're right here walking with the king. We're living with him. He's living in us. And a lot of us don't really get who he is. We don't get the power that's at his, that's at his disposal, the authority that he carries. We don't get it. We don't get his deity or his power. All right, listen to this. I'm going to share with you. I'm going to paint a picture of Jesus. Some of you may have never, ever seen. Because I want you to know when you face a demon, he ain't nothing compared to Jesus. When you face evil, it ain't nothing compared to Jesus. When you look fear in the face, it's got to bow to the love of God. All right. <clears throat> now, here we go. Huh. I felt to do this, and this is the first time I felt to do it. I'm going to read a few excerpts from my book, and I want you to hear the picture that's painted. I put it in cinematic form, dramatic format, so you get a real clear picture. So if it doesn't sound real holy and scriptural, watch the movie as I paint the picture. Get the image I'm trying to show you of who Jesus really is. <clears throat> According to Revelation chapter 19. Now, I want you to hear this. Chapter 19 starting at verse 7. It's that time. So let's rejoice in honor of our Lord. Make preparations for the marriage of the Lamb and his bride, who has been getting ready individually as members of the church age, according to Revelations 2 and 3. 19, 7, excuse me, 19 verse 8. It was bestowed to her to be dressed and draped in the finest pure white linen representing the righteousness of the saints. That's the righteousness of Christ. John is instructed to write down what is spoken at that moment. A blessing is applied to all those who are invited to the marriage banquet of the Lamb. We see that God is true to his word. Now, I'm going to go on down because all the things are coming together. And I want you to see, after the magnificent scene that John sees, then all of a sudden, he's looking at, at 19 verse 11. A magnificent scene is taking place as I, John, am witnessing heaven open up and a white horse and his rider called Faithful and True judging justly, judging righteously, and in like manner, making 
war. So we're not looking at the little baby in the manger, are we? We're looking at something with fire in his eyes. His eyes are glowing like flames of fire. His head is covered with multiple crowns. His name is written, but no one knows what it is except him. Verse 13, he is wearing a garment that is immersed in blood. Now this is believed to be the blood of his foes. Isaiah 63, verse 3 and 4. He is seen here as judge and warrior, not a meek little lowly lamb. He is a man of war ready for battle. The armies described here are referring to the saints, meaning the meaning of the white horses, clothed in the righteousness, hence white, clean linen. The sharp sword coming out of his mouth is all he needs to overthrow the nations. In other words, he obliterates the nations with his word. That's the two-edged sword. Ruling the nations with a rod of iron, that means that he will be a hard taskmaster to the sinful nations, treading the winepress of the fierceness and anger of Almighty God, striking the nations with his fierce, unrelenting wrath. Verse 16, on his clothes and thigh, John sees that a name has been written. It reads, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, this is when it gets juicy right here. Listen to this. It's when you hear how he overthrows the enemy. Listen to this. That's what 19 and 20 are doing. It's showing you the comparison of Jesus versus the enemy, the false prophet, the antichrist, all of that. Listen to this. Starting at 17, this is 17, 18, 19, 20. It's just, it's going on to the end. John is bearing witness to the fierce, awesome sight of a strong angel standing in the sun, summoning loudly to all the fowl that fly. They are to swoop in on the supper of the great God to gather and devour the carcasses of kings, captains, the mighty, even the horses and their riders. He continues listing the flesh of all types of humanity, rich, poor, free, captive, small and great. John sees the beast calling all kings of the world with their armies to wage war against the one who sits on the white horse with his army. The one refers to Jesus. As John continues watching this amazing scenario, he sees the beast and the false prophet get the surprise of their lives. These are the two by whom miracles were wrought, by whom many were deceived, who also forced many to receive the mark of the beast and worship his image. John gets to watch the beast and the false prophet get catapulted alive into the lake of fire, flowing with burning lava and steeped in all its flames. Burn, baby, burn. Sounds like an appropriate accompanying remark right there, doesn't it? And all the rest were marked as targets by the blood dripping from the sword that belongs to the rider, that's Jesus, of the white horse. Keep in mind, this is the sword that comes out of his mouth. Imagine the gory, gruesome, this is a different scene now. Imagine the gory, gruesome scene, the images, as John watches the swarming mass of summoned winged fowl devouring all the flesh off the bones of every defeated foe. Pat's two cents. I don't think you want Jesus as your enemy. Do you? All right, chapter 20. Listen to this now. This is the introduction. A violent eviction ensues. But first, here's an eye opener you cannot afford to miss. Stay tuned for the grand finale as it unfolds with fury and grandeur. Dr. Curtis Dotson's eye opener is thrilling as he alludes to the curious word theodicy, which deals with the power of the devil and the power of God. The devil is not equal to God, which is adamantly pointed out by the honorable professor. He continues, 
The devil is only equal to an angel. These are in quotes from the lecture. The devil is not the opposite of God. God has no worthy opponent. God is not the opposite of evil. Let me repeat that in the correct form. Good is not the opposite of evil. Otherwise, evil would be just as strong as good. Fact, it is not as strong as good. Good is the dominating force here. The devil is not God's opposite. He is no equal. Gabriel and Michael, the angels, are the devil's opposites. They are God's generals, high-ranking, powerful angels who overpower Satan all the time. Adding my pats to sense to the mix brings us to the one more undeniable fact that needs repeating. That is that the devil is not, neither will he ever be, a worthy opponent to God. God's goodness vindicates while evil bows. You hear me? Now, I'm stopping right there real quick. Some of you don't know the authority you have in Jesus. You don't understand the power that comes right from your own mouth. Why? If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, that Holy Spirit is the spirit of the living God. And if you don't activate, activate the power that's in you, you will be the whipping board of Satan at every turn. Why? Because you don't know in whom you believe. You don't understand the power and authority you have in Jesus. Don't be a wimp to the devil. Don't be afraid of demons. Don't be intimidated by their threats, by their little attempts to harm you. What does God's word say? He will know it and no, mm. <laughs> no wise will you be harmed. I said it backwards, but you get it. All right, let me continue here. Ha! Huh. God's goodness vindicates while evil bows. God reigns supreme and is the ultimate authority. That's my final answer. Now, feast your eyes on this. Focus your eyes on the eviction of a lifetime. You know what it looks like when people get evicted, right? Well, you're going to see something here. <laughs> <clears throat> While the mighty angel, like a modern-day marshal, dramatically usurps his authority and comes with vengeance, Romans 12, verse 19, to remove the relentless squatter, Satan, off the property, the earth round, or the sea. The mighty angel catapults a red dragon to where? Who is this red dragon? Hmm. Then this hideous, intimidating creature is suddenly overtaken, bound and chained for how long? Lasting throughout whose reign on earth? Read on, learn all about it. The thousand year reign highlighted in this chapter and the magnificent, majestic king. Enter the millennium, chapter 20. I'm almost done now, so just hang with me on this because I'm trying to paint a picture for those of you who are so easily intimidated by things that go bump in the night by demons showing themselves, by hearing a demon's voice, or feeling his presence hold you down in the bed in the middle of the night. Now, baby, you got Jesus. Enter the millennium. Verse 1. John beholds an angel coming down from heaven. This is chapter 20. John beholds an angel coming down from heaven with a key. It means power and authority in one's hand. He holds power and authority in one hand and a chain, strength, and to overpower and arrest Satan. That's what that chain is for, to overpower and arrest Satan. That's in the other hand, his right hand. One could ask oneself, <clears throat> looking while looking on, what in the world? The following verses will make it crystal clear. Kick your feet up and read on with sheer delight. You're going to love this. Take a moment to gloat while imagining all that John is beholding. 
Picture a massive, strapping, powerful, Herculean angel as he appears on the scene, filling the lens with his awesomeness. This is an epic moment of biblical proportion. Zoom in on the key and chain that the angel is holding in his hand. Freeze the frame and ponder that for a moment. Next, zoom out slowly. Feel it? The eerie atmosphere is progressively darkening. The ominous sound effects as the music fades are growing louder and louder. Sudden claps of thunder echo in rapid succession through our all creation. A ghastly sight appears in the form of a grotesque beast taking on the shape of a red dragon. A chilling silence fills the air. All eyes are on this hideous monstrosity of a creature. He is none other than the devil called Satan, the father of lies, Lucifer, the antithesis of all that God is, love, truth, the ultimate authority. Watch closely as the dragon is seized. He is taken by surprise in a flash by the strong angel who grabs takes captive and places that old devil on lockdown for 1,000 years. He cannot break free, nor will he ever escape. A promise from, ver from chapter 13, verse 11. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. In everyday terms, the one who holds others captives gets to be held captive himself. In colloquial terms, what goes around comes around. Galatians 6, 7 does not mince its words. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Wow, one may not ever have to pay the piper in this life, but payday is coming and it's forever. Visualize the massive, powerful angel described above, taking Satan hostage and slamming his powerless body down. Picture that old devil descending head first, faster than a speeding bullet, deep down into the bottomless pit. The millennial smackdown, to quote Dr. Ron Felton, is keeping the devil sealed up and chained under lock and key. <clears throat> Ooh. At this point, the nations will be free from satanic deception throughout the millennium because the devil is serving a 1,000-year prison term. After serving his term, the devil will be placed on probation and let out for a short interval of time. The scene changes and the setting is now in heaven where John sees the true servants of God sitting on their thrones. During the millennial reign of Christ, it is appointed for them, chosen church, to rule and reign and judge the world. He also sees the tribulation saints getting beheaded for their testimony of Christ for not accepting the mark of the beast, for not worshiping the beast nor his image. Thus, they get to enjoy living and reigning with Christ throughout the millennium. However, the remaining dead don't get to live again until the millennial comes to a close, which is the first resurrection. Then the second resurrection occurs after the millennium ends. Joyful and jubilant is the one who is included in the first resurrection. <clears throat> they are set apart by God. They serve God and minister. They have authority to rule politically and at royal levels. This is all talking about the church, the, red, the rapture church, the bride of Christ. Okay, all of this happens over a thousand year period. They will be exempt from experiencing the second death. They are redeemed, which is their rite of passage, so to speak. These are the, the tribulation saints. All right, so 20 verse 7. They are redeemed, which is their rite of passage, so to speak, to eternal bliss. 20 verse 7 and on. After the thousand years, 
come to a close. Satan is temporarily released. Now you're going to love this part. On parole. The devil is busy once again doing what he always does. At this point in time, he is deceiving all the nations in all four quadrants of the globe, north, east, south, and west. At Gog and Magog, he's endeavoring to muster up his innumerable army for battle. They mount up across the full span of the earth, surrounding the people of God and the new city. Pay close attention to what happens next. Not a single word is spoken. Not one weapon is forged or wielded by any of God's angels or people. Now watch carefully. Wait for it. Wait for it. A blaze comes down like a fireball from heaven in an explosive blast that consumes and obliterates them in an instant. That's it. The war is over. As Isaiah chapter 40 verse 1 and 2 so eloquently puts it, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished. Another way of saying the second half of this is be of good cheer. It is finished and there is no more war. Verse 10. Hark! John hears the roar of merciless flames blazing with searing heat. This horrific noise is coming from a place called in the Hebrew tongue Gehenna, hell. A long name for this place of torment is the lake of fire, and it is opening its mouth wide. Visualize as the devil himself is being hurled with vehement force into the lake of fire, where his cohorts, the Antichrist, the beast, and the false prophet are suffering from the flames that are never quenched. Neither is there an end to their suffering. This is the eternal consequence for all the lost souls they systematically deceived and destroyed. Verse 11, I see him that sitteth, referring to Jesus, and he is on the great white throne. The white depicts purity and holiness. The judgment that takes place there is holy and true. Ergo, all the impure and unclean will run from his presence like Adam and Eve did after sinning against him in the garden. That seems to be human nature worldwide. John 5.22 basically identifies Jesus passing judgment. Jesus is our rock, but to the sinner, he is a rock of offense. Romans 9.33 says it clearly. Now John is watching as the dead, small and great, stand before God, and he sees the book opening as well as another. Starting with the dead, judging is imposed for the deeds that are written in the books based on all the actions, behaviors, that, and behaviors that are recorded therein. These are the sinners from the beginning who repented not. Everyone has to give account. 20 verse 14, death and Hades are brought into the lake of fire. This is referred to as the second death. Whoever's name is not found recorded in the Lamb's book of life finds himself trashed and tormented always as he is hurled into the lake of fire to stay forever keeping the devil company. Hmm. Now, what I want to say, I want to re read this intro and I'm done. You have no idea who you serve. You run around hiding from things to go bump in the night. You worry about somebody casting a curse on you. Somebody uh, quote lamin, uh all kind of uh, incantations. And you fear uh, walking around uh, 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 under a, uh, what do you call it, a ladder. You, you're superstitious. You got all kinds of fears. My mother used to hit the ceiling if I put a hat on the bed. I mean, people have all kind of, people throw sand salt over their shoulder for good luck. They actually believe in luck. Baby, there is no such thing as luck. You're either blessed or you're cursed. You decide. You make that choice by who you choose to serve. You can serve the risen Savior or you can serve, you can live a losing battle. 
mm, with the one who ultimately loses at the end. Chapter 21, and I'm done. I'm not reading the whole thing. I'm just reading a few sentences. This is my intro, and I'm stopping there. See the new heaven and new earth. New Jerusalem is descending toward the earth. The bride is prepared and adorned for her husband. That's the resurrected, raptured church. Mm -hmm. That's the one that started <laughs> in the book of Acts in chapter 2. That's the beginning of the church age. The rapture is the end of the church age. Just a little FYI. All right. The bride is prepared and adorned for her husband. An announcement or decree is made about no more tears. There is something different about this tabernacle. Who are the people that are shouting praises to God? John is taken to a very high mountain. He is also made aware of three heavens. The first, the second, and the third heaven are all defined in the following paragraphs where we also meet the bride in all her splendor and beauty. Ju and her jewel magnificence is there for all to see. This is a wonderful sight to behold. How overwhelming it all is. As you continue to read the book of Revelation, and I'm done. I'm done with the reading, but I'm not done with the message. I'm almost done. When, when you realize who Jesus is, when you know the end of the story, Dr. Curtis Dodson used to say, how can you understand the Bible if you don't know how the story ends? When I studied the book of Revelation, it made Isaiah clearer. It made Ezekiel clearer. It made Daniel make sense. I saw the types and shadows in Genesis. I saw the types and shadows right there in Exodus. It's all there. Throughout the Bible, you see Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's how I know of his deity. I've also seen. But my point to you is, do you know in whom you believe? Are you afraid of the devil? Are you intimidated by things that go bump in the night? Are you worried about what this one can do to you, what that one can do to you? They sit on the toilet just like you do. They cough and breathe and eat just like you do. They have to take a bath and put on deodorant just like you do. And if they don't, they'll stink just like you will. But you're intimidated by these people. They don't hold any authority over your life. I don't care if they own the company that you work at. They're not your authority. God is. You are to respect and honor them for their position. But you are not to fear them. Not when you serve a risen Savior. Some of you spouses are afraid of your better or worse half, however you want to put that, because they are physically volatile towards you. They're abusive verbally. They're abusive physically. They're disrespectful. They abuse you in ways that it, it just gets all in your head. And you are so afraid of them that you're afraid to turn left, turn right, take your life back in, uh, into control. You're afraid to take the reins out of their hand and go your merry way. Why? They have, con have convinced you that you can't do without them. No, baby, let me convince you, you cannot do without Jesus in your life. He's the one. He's the lover of your soul. He's the one that's, that sets and prepares the road ahead of you. He's the one that goes ahead of you, makes the crooked places straight and the rough places smooth and plain. He's the one that knows the plans he has for your life. He's the one who will heal you by his stripes. You are healed. He's the one that says no weapon formed against you will prosper. He's the one that says in any one who speaks against you, they, you will condemn 
He's the one that says he will make you look good in Isaiah 54. He's the one that tells you to, to, to prepare yourself for the blessings to come. But no, you won't do it. Why? Because you're intimidated by the shadow of this one and that one and the other one. Why are you so easily intimidated? Because you don't understand in whom you serve. You don't understand the power that's in God's hand. Don't whip out at any sign of trouble, at any sign of... Don't whip out over anything, baby. God is always in control. There are lessons we learn in life. There are experiences we go through in life. It's not because God is a mean ogre. It's because we live in a fallen world. So next time you want to ask yourself, why does bad things happen to good people? That's why. Not because God is not faithful. Why do good people die and bad people live? Sometimes God's given the good people a way of escape so they can come be with him in eternal bliss, in eternal glory and beauty. While the ones he's still working on need to be here longer because he's trying to save their soul. And they're fighting him every step of the way. There's a lot to God's wisdom. He knows what he's doing. For him to go from Genesis all the way over to the book of Revelation. And all the things people have done. They've sinned against him. They, they've disobeyed him. They, they fought against him. They, they disrespected him. They, they had idol worship. They worshipped other gods and other images. They strayed away. They committed adultery, fornication, murder, all kind of crap. And to see that God loves us enough to send his son to die for this crooked and perverse generation. And he is still knocking, begging, and pleading with us to open the door for him to come in and sup with us. That's a loving God, y'all. But he's loving now. He's loving now when the restrainer leaves this planet. And he's ready to cast judgment on the world. He's going to be our judge. Jesus rather than being our savior, will be our judge. Will you be here when the tribulation starts? Or will you avoid, will you be willing to do what it takes to avoid that horrible time that's coming? And I leave you with that question. Seek God. Seek his face. He will manifest himself to you. Don't seek his hand. Don't seek his money. Don't seek his favor. Don't, I'm saying just don't just do that. He's not a good time Charlie and he's not Santa Claus. He's not your bellhop that goes out and, and does your commands. And y'all stop talking to angels. That's God's job. You go to God, make your request made known. Ask God to tell the angels to do this, that, or the other. Dispatch his angels. Don't order God around. And don't you order this, the angels around. They are there to obey God, not you. But they're there to serve you by God's will. As God leads them. So you ask God to send the angels to do this, that, or the other. But you stop praying to angels. That's another form of idol worship. Anyway, God bless you. Be encouraged. When you pray to God, pray to God in the name of the Son. Pray to the Father. In the name of the Son. And be filled with the Holy Ghost. You read that book of Revelation. And that will strengthen your faith in the God you serve. And the wisdom he has. How he put all of that. Wove it all together. To come around for our victory and our good. All things work together. For our good. For those who love God. And are called according to his purpose. Do you love him? Or are you called do you want to? Hmm. Ask him into your heart. And those of you who are walking with him, get to know who he really is. Some of you don't read the word. That's why your faith is so weak. That's why you're so easily intimidated by things that go bump in the night. 
My eyeballs that stare at you in the middle of the night. You see eyeballs looking at you at night? You tell them suckers to get out of your house in the name of Jesus. Whatever you rebuke, whatever you refuse, always do it in the name of Jesus. And you'll have a lot more power working with you than trying to do it on your own. All right, I'm done. I know that was a strange way to approach a message, but I felt led of God to read those particular ones in my commentary. Which, may, which brings the language down to earth and makes it easier to understand what the book of Revelation says. Hopefully my book will be available sometime in July, hopefully. I'm trying to get it wrapped up this month. But anyway, God bless you guys. Be blessed. Don't be stressed. And as the word says, he will keep you in perfect peace if you keep your mind stayed on him. Amen.